This is the DLR Cast, the essential podcast for fans of Diamond David Lee Roth. All right, once again, here we are at the DLR Cast. Darren, how are you, my friend? I think I'm good. Am I good? You're always good, buddy. Oh. I, on the other hand, I wonder about a lot of things. There's things that just cross my mind. Like I realized recently I got a good job. I'm making lots of money. <laughs> I look good and I'm funny. So why am I lonesome, honey? I mean, that is that sums it up where I'm at right now. That those are some sensible shoes. That one, <laughs> that one, I got pretty easily. But I thought when I said, "Am I good?" and I thought you should have said, "You're damn good." You're damn good. Yes, indeed, my friend. I'm always amazed that just I can I can do this with a bunch of different bands, but certainly with Dave's because his lyrics are just fantastic. But a lot of them, I could just like, yeah, you know what? That's where my head's at. I get that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, nothing but yeah, as he himself has been known to say. Indeed. So we got a great interview today, none other than a guy who played guitar with Dave for quite a while, Brian Young. Yeah, the longest tenured, if I've done my research correctly, definitely the longest tenured guitar player that he had. Because when you think about it, Steve Vai was there from 86 to 90. 90. Okay, so that's uh, 80, oh, no, 80, actually 86 to, well, through 88, 89, through the Skyscraper Tour. Even yeah, smiling so, skyscraper. And then it was Jason Becker and and, uh, you know, so and that was unfortunately short lived. And Bart Walsh was a few years. Brian Young is six or seven years, depending on how you do your your calendar. He was there from the the O2 relaunch. Um, I don't know if the gigs that he did, the festival or two that he get, did with Dave were long before the Sammy tour. But he was there for the Sammy tour in 02. He was there for the subsequent touring and the Diamond Dave promotion, the Strumming with the Devil album, which he was still touring on through 07. And he even played with Dave on air for that radio show uh, when he took over for Howard Stern in a couple of dozen markets. So talk about being around. He, You know, the drummer changed. The bassist changed. Brian Young was the guy that was there the whole time. Yeah, he he nailed it down. And when you f- find stuff on YouTube, one of my favorite things with him on YouTube, there's a version of Mean Street yes. uh, that just smokes. I mean, f- unbelievable. It's just killer. I mean, that was a really tight band. That I mean, unsurprisingly, because it's Dave, right? But Brian Young was there, man. I mean, he could he could play any of the solo stuff. He certainly, you know, did wonders with the with the van halen stuff which is no easy task i'm sure but he it it really worked you could tell there was a rapport there was a chemistry and he didn't uh, it didn't seem to me like he was a hired hand just playing just playing this stuff wrote right i mean and that band was was genuinely tight he came from atomic punks but if you do your research and you listen to old brian young interviews he's not one of those guys that was a van halen diehard that said one day i'm going to replace eddie it's more like oh cool steady gig and then right. actually people saw him and went wow that guy's good and david lee roth had recruited a couple of people from atomic punks over the years inclu- including uh wait wasn't ray luzier from it didn't yeah where he found ray ray wasn't in until i don't was, ray wasn't in atomic punks i thought he was i'm pretty sure brian young was the third person that he pulled from atomic punks hmm um, I did. I forgot about this too. That he played on a bunch of tracks on what as what so far as Ross' last solo album, the Diamond Dave album, yeah, two thousand three, and that was all mainly cover albums. Which it always made me wonder why Brian did. I mean, just for where Dave was at his when you look at that time span that he was with mm-hmm. that Brian Young was with him, it wasn't like there was a ton of output. But it would have been cool to see what would happen if they maybe they did. But it would have been cool to see what would happen if they ever actually wrote together. Yeah. Well, one of the things that comes up pretty early in the interview, you know, to guide it, guide it along, I first want to get not be like, hey, here's question number one. David Lee Roth was blank, 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 blank. The you know, the preface on this whole thing is there. Were, Brian doesn't do a lot of interviews, but there was an interview that came out with him about a month and a half to two months ago. And one of those clickbaity fake news kinds of things happened where the quote or the headline that got picked up was something like. Yeah, I've seen Dave blow up at people. Like, it was, yeah, or he's or he's hard to work with was the big yeah, thing. Yeah, there, there was just that like unfair kind of thing. And I saw a Facebook post from him where he's like, "Hey, cool interview I did, but kind of a bummer that people picked up on this." So I wanted to be mindful 
of that and not just rush into all these kinds of questions. And first, you know, get to explore who is this guy? Who, right. who is Brian Young? Where did he come from? Because if you're a Roth fan, you would just, you know, know, hey, so he started playing with Dave after he was in the Atomic Punks. And if you dig a little more, you'll see that he was in a band with Jeff Scott Soto and he had a major label deal or two. And he was always floating around, but he almost like he came from nowhere. So, like, how yeah. did that happen? And then we get into a little bit of, like, how did he wind up in Dave's band? And even when you're not asking questions directly about Dave, you get some interesting factoids about working with Dave. And he he spins it all. I'm going to say it's 98 percent just positive. He makes a mm-hmm. comment at the beginning that kind of corrects about the Dave flyer ups. But um, I think you get to know a bit about Dave's quirks from just listening to Brian speak. Yeah. And he and listen. If you're playing with Dave, you get who the boss is, right? Yeah. You know it's you're gonna have the time of your life, but you also know who's writing that paycheck, and you already know that Dave's a demanding guy, and there's a way he he wants to do the he he wants to put on put forth some form of excellence out there and stay true to the songs and demands a lot from you. So I all that clickbaity stuff. That's what people. That's what you had to kind of read into a little bit, read farther down in those articles is like. Yeah, he was great. (laughs) And he knows what he wants. Yeah. So you'll quickly pick up on the fact that Brian, he's a good hang. (laughs) That's one of the first things. You know, do you know what I'm saying when I say hang? A lot of people you'll see are in bands because they're a good hang, not because they're the best player. It's because as part of the audition process, the person goes, could I stand being on a bus or flights or like waiting in an airport with this person? Or are they going to get on my last nerve? You quickly see that Brian's relaxed guy, but you also pick up that he's a smart, high IQ person who does his homework, who's not an overnight success. So I was just so delighted to speak with him. He pulls no punches, but at the same time comes across as a pleasant human being. And he's also not just hanging his hat on being Dave Lee Roth's chosen guitar player. As we go into the interview, uh, he, as I asked about, he was potentially going to do that Vegas residency. He just had a scheduling thing. That's something that he's uh, talked about a little bit. So if he was good enough for Dave in 02 and 06 (laughs) and potentially 2020, obviously he's easy to work with. Now, we've seen Brett Tuggle, you know, come in and out of the picture and Greg Bissonette come in and out of the picture. But a lot of the people in the history of Dave Lee Roth are kind of one tour and they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. And I, sometimes I often wondered, is that is that the personality conflicts of people or is it availability or is it just also Dave wanted to try some different people? But there was that time where Brian Young was around for a while. Ray Luzier was around for a while. Yeah. Um, I'm spacing on the bass player's name. Forgive me. Was it James Dave? Lomenzo? Oh, yeah. 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 And so, you know, that there was some consistency there for a little bit. Right. Um, but, yeah, you're right. There's been some different guys around. When we look back, I mean, uh, one of our early interviews here, we interviewed um, Ron Wils- uh, Wixo Ron, from yeah. yeah, from who did the Your Filthy Little Mouth tour, uh, which was all of like eight or nine months. Right. But wasn't yeah. on any studio album. So. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to chart if you made that kind of – the family tree for people who played with Dave would be – have all sorts of weird offshoots and directions to it. Yeah, the, then there's also – aside from the good hang principle, there's also the like tree of he's a good studio drummer, but he's not a good touring drummer. Or the he's a good touring drummer, but not a good studio drummer. Right. I remember hearing with Korn where Ray Luzier has now been for like 14 years. He, yeah been in corn he went from dlr to corn so ray luzier is doing well and great drummer and he deserves it yeah but but i think right before ray luzier went to corn they had terry bozio for an album like uh their their drummer corn did yeah Bozio is an amazing, that guy's an amazing drummer. He's on one of my favorite Jeff Beck records, Guitar yeah. Shop. I was always a big Missing Persons fan. That guy can play just about anything. He can play anything. But I think he went into it thinking that he was going to be the touring drummer. And they kind of went, we just want you on the on studio. We don't want it on the road. And so we th- that happened with Event Sevenfold, where they got Mike Portnoy mm-hmm. from Dream Theater do an album and he's like so when does the tour start and they're like uh 
you're just doing the album. That's kind of happened through history. So Brian Young is the guy who is good enough to be in the studio and the tour and the morning show <laughs> that Dave did. And if you see any of the TV appearances with uh, Strumming with the Devil, he did all of them but Conan. So he was good enough to play along the Nashville Cats. So, you know, wow. that that was Dave's sidekick. That was his guy for a long time. Well, it, it's interesting how they're all – how so many of these guys get connected. I mean, well, I would love to someday get Ray Luzier on No Pressure. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Luzier played – did you know he was the drummer for Steel Panther for a minute? I did not yeah. know that. I had the pleasure of interviewing Ray about two years ago. He had a super group. Sorry to hijack the conversation. No, no worries. I asked him about Dave during the interview. This is pre-DLR cast uh, because – you know, if I saw the DLR band in that era like four or five times, Jimmy DeGrasso was on the drums the last time. So I asked him, you know, what's the timeline to quitting Roth to going into Corn? And he said the reason that he quit David Lee Roth, when he first got it, he needed the money. And same thing with Steel Panther. He's like, sure. I don't want to be in a funny band, but hey, I need the work. I need the money. And he's still friends with those guys. They're still cool. But in the case of Roth, he said, I thought that we were going to be doing original music at some point. I didn't want to just be in a tribute band and this was a tribute band. So that's why he parted ways. Yeah. Yeah. And one other thing, not to make this a Ray Luzier thing, but <laughs> you just reminded me that before Corn, he was in a really cool band that I love. They only did one album called Army of Anyone with the DeLeo yeah. brothers from Stone Temple Pilots and Richard Patrick from Filter. And yeah. I had the pleasure of seeing that band when they did their one and only tour. I love that record. I, I Not to go down this road, but I will listen to anything the DeLeo brothers do. So Same here. But does that mean you listen to that Alien Ant Farm album they produced? Uh, that they play on and write. Uh, <laughs> let me draw, including talk show. Remember that? And I Stone... loved talk show. That hello same here. Is great. I just listened to that album a couple of weeks ago, actually, about a week or two ago. It just popped into my head. I was like, oh my God, this was, uh, I love everything Stone Temple Pilots have done with, um, with or without, what's that? <laughs> Wyland, Scott Wyland. Thank you. I mean, when Chester Bennington was in there and they did an EP, and I think this new guy is great. And I mean, I just think they, um, I just think, I think some people underrate Stone Temple Pilots, and and they've certainly had a really long career. But those guys can do anything, the DeLeo brothers. So, and, and one time when I met Richard Patrick, I said, "Hey, so is there going to be this? This is about like six years ago. Hey, is there going to be a second Army of Anyone album?" He's like, "Oh, totally, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting to hear from them. I think yeah. he was serious, but." Well, Richard Patrick's one of the nicest guys. I spent some time with him back in my label days during a couple of, uh, was it 2007, 2008, a couple filter records around there when yeah. they reformed. And just the coolest guy. And I was, must have been the last person on earth to, know, to, to put together the fact that his brother is Robert Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, we're, we're big Robert Patrick fans in this household. And I, my wife, I don't think, knew that. And it's, it's interesting to see you have two brothers in two different entertainment aspects like that that are unrelated to each other but both successful without leveraging each other's careers yeah what is what are the odds of that right it's pretty pretty interesting so well getting back to brian young here before we get to this interview i it, it's awesome great job I, he seems like a really interesting guy it's somebody who I, man i would love to have picked his brain and go a little bit deeper on some of those things but you know it's kind of tricky good for you for walking the tightrope there because obviously it's for the dlr cast but we also want to you know you also want to concentrate on what somebody's doing now and 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 stay up to date on that it's, you can't just always be a look back i guess yeah. Then after this episode goes viral and everyone talks about it, then we go for the part two NDA episode of. So tell me <laughs> after you earn your trust, then you burn the bridge with all the questions. So you go, oh, <laughs> tell me the, the two handed guitar tapping technique. Uh, no, no. He he actually opened up about a, a thing or two, you know, a little bit of a uh, I'll give the half spoiler tease. If you saw Brian Young on uh, the tours in 04 or 05, you'll learn what he might have been doing during the keyboard solo of Jump. <laughs> okay. Enough said there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thanks. On that on that note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Th thanks to everyone for listening. And uh, maybe uh, my 
previously unreleased David Lee Roth interview will happen one of these episodes. I, oh, it, yeah. Only if you guys ask for it. We, I'm asking for it, my friend. It's really good. It's fun to listen to, and 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 we'll tease it a little bit. But at the time when you did that interview, it was it was uh, it was well every era of Dave's career is really interesting. But just uh, it was real. It's a really good interview, man. I I enjoyed it a lot. It's tough to listen to yourself when you're 19 and and, and all that, but uh, I'm I'm not totally ashamed of it. It's like I'm 95% proud of it. It's just you listen to your questions and you go, oh, <laughs> what but, I could have asked in retrospect. Yeah, oh yeah, what you could have asked, but what you did ask, it was a great conversation. And I, had you not had told me you were 19 right from the jump, I I would bet most people wouldn't. I wouldn't have guessed. Yeah, so I hope we can get that out in the in the near future, but only if other people ask. You know, it's like when you see Kiss and Paul Stanley says he's only going to fly uh, over to the second stage unless people yell for him. Uh, people right. Fall. Well, right. it's like if you guys yell Darren, uh, we'll we'll release it off. All right. Um, All right. Yell, yell Darren at the <laughs> DLR cast at Outlook dot com. <laughs> there you go. But thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Steve for being an excellent co-host. <laughs> thanks for David Lee Roth. Thanks. You know, just like, I, like I always say, if, if you folks who are listening have half as much fun as we do recording this thing, that's a victory. So thank you. Exactly. Thanks all. I know that you were able to tour a little bit or have been able to tour, so you haven't been totally off the road. So what's keeping you busy at the moment besides those great YouTube videos? That Vandenberg one was great. Oh, yeah. Um, well, actually, our band, the Spasmatics out here, has been playing. Um, we were shut down completely last April and May of 2020. But then in June, we started, you know, finding places that we could do a show at with like, you know, a 25% capacity. So, you know, the, the money was low and the capacity was low, but we were able to play. So, um, in fact, the very first thing we did was a live stream. And it, it actually it was in May at the end of May. So we did, we, we went a little over 40 days without a show. And that was probably the longest since I've been playing guitar that sure. I went without playing a live show 40 days in a row. I, I've never done that in my life. So our band, we hadn't played a single show in 40 days and, um, we were expecting to have a pretty rough show, but it actually went real smooth. We were, we were kind of laughing that we, we were all ready for a bunch of mistakes and stuff, but it was it was good. So anyways, um, then just shows started popping up, um, one, maybe two or three a month. So And then, uh, then it got kind of to where we almost had most of our Fridays and Saturdays. So that's like eight shows a month. And it's all, you know, it's slowly getting bigger, even though they've now opened Texas, allegedly, you know, 100% where you're allowed to stay open. Most of the businesses are still keeping it limited. The clubs are playing at are still limiting and they're doing that on their own because they're getting calls from customers that are worried right. about this stuff. So they're just easing their way back into it. So, um, but we've actually, I have a lot of friends in California who've played zero shows in the past year. Yeah. We've played like 50 shows or 60 probably uh, since COVID started. So we're, we're doing really well out here. We're lucky. And then also, as I mentioned, we've seen you do some great videos where you're playing some of your old favorite songs and putting them up on YouTube. Is that more of a practice exercise for you? No, it's just fun. Um, like I practice. I just, you know, late at night, I'll just turn, put my guitar on and jam along with whatever. I mean, I always play. But uh, it all started, well, for me, it first started by... Um, the first few months of COVID and there was nothing going on. We were, and we were literally locked in the house, you know, you're, you know, you're allowed to go to the store and get food. And that was pretty much it. Right. So, um, the, the, for those two months for the, I went through like a depression at first, obviously you go through this sure. thing where you're like, the world's coming into an end. This sucks. Everything's going to, we're all going to die. And then, um, I, I went through this and after I went through the depression, I said, okay, I'm going to start just filming myself. First thing I did was just play along with some songs just for fun of it. And that was what's funny is I, you know, I was doing almost one a day for a while. And uh, next thing you know, I've, all these people are asking me, hey, can you record on this? Can you record on that? And I thought, OK, well, and the truth is, you know, in the 80s and 90s, I was always the guy in the band that had the studio. You know, I was always back in the day in the 80s. I got my four track and I did all the band demos. And then I, I got the eight track and I did all the band demos. And then I got the 16 track ADAT and I did all the band demos. And I was the band demo guy for years and years. 
And finally, when I moved to Austin in 2007, I left my studio gear in LA and I go, we're booked 250 shows a year. We're, I'm, I'll do the live stuff and not do any recording. I would, not that I didn't like doing it, but I, I guess I felt kind of like a little bit tired of being the only guy that always had to buy all the studio gear and do everything while everyone else in the bands I played with just got to use my gear, you know? So I, I finally want to be like the guy that just, I just play guitar now. So, um, but the, bu the bummer about that was over the past 10 years, yeah. I haven't kept up on the studio stuff. I never really went to, to digital, or I should say, I never went to computer. I, I, the last thing I had was ADAT, you know, 16 track ADAT, which is still tape. Yeah. And, um, so it took me a while to get, I, I got Pro Tools 10 or 12 years ago and I used it a little bit when I was in Austin. And then I really just did live music for the past 10, 12 years. And so because of this uh, COVID and everyone being locked at home, people started wanting to record more. So I would, had to go out and get Logic Pro and learn how to use it. So I was kind of a beginner again. I had experience, but I was a beginner in, in the computer world of, of recording. So it was, it was a little strange, uh, just the concept of like a, a virtual signal path. I used to see wires, you know, <laughs> plugs this into that, bus this there. And so it took me a little while to get used to this virtual signal path. And uh, so uh, Michael T. Ross uh, from Lita Ford and uh, from the Rating the Rock Vault, he was the person, actually this girl, Kathy Katie. Hey, Kathy. Um, she's the one who's a mutual friend of ours. And we, me and Mike know each other, but um, we really hadn't, other than Facebook hadn't really spoke, spoken in like 10 years. And mm -hmm. she suggested that we get together and do the Vandenberg Burning Heart song. It was, it was Kathy Katie's idea. And so uh, I called up Mike and I said, you know, hey, let's do this song. And, and so uh, he already was working with Phil Verone uh, a oh, lot yeah. for the Saigon Kick. They had been doing a lot of recording. Yeah. And uh, in fact, he was kind of had just started doing these videos, um, Mike and them. And Phil was doing the video editing. And then a, a bass player named Alex Rodriguez, they were like kind of the trio of guys that were putting stuff together. And so uh, because of Kathy, we did, we did Burning Heart. And then uh, I asked them, I said, hey, what, what do you guys think of getting Jeff Scott Soto to sing on it? Because I just knew his Roll voice. Yeah, yeah, I just, and also he, I just knew he was going to kill that song. I mean, I couldn't yeah. think of anybody who would make it sound better than him. And so, uh, of course, when I called Jeff, he was completely busy. He was doing two records at the same time. I could tell by the, he was in the middle of recording when I called him and I could hear the hoarseness in his voice. Like he's sure. been singing for three or four days. And then I'm about to ask him if he wants to sing for free on his song. <laughs> so it was kind of like, Oh no. And luckily I mentioned the song burning heart. And he says, Oh, that's my favorite Vandenberg song. So I kind of knew that I had a shot, you know, I said, Hey, well, we're going to do it for fun. You know, you want to, you want to sing on it. And he said, well, give me some time. So we send him out the track and, and, you know, it only took him about a week to get around to doing it. So I, I knew it could have taken weeks because he was really busy and, do, you know, you, you're doing session work all day long for, for your living. And then yeah. to do it for free, uh, you try to save your voice at some point. Well, you're in that same kind of boat that not every single thing that you've done is online by any stretch of the imagination. It's not like when you look up Brian Young, hey, he's playing on this today, this tomorrow. This. You've kind of been under the radar, but always busy. You like if we go back to to, you know, when you were in Roth's band, you were flying out on off nights and playing other gigs, which blows my mind. You know, yeah, you're this. I, got that, that, I think Ray Luzier was a, a big instigator in in that style for me, because back when I was when, when Ray Luzier was playing with Dave for a few years before I was and I knew yeah. Ray really well and uh, they'd go on tour. And then I'd see Ray on his day off doing a drum clinic or doing a gig. And, and I remember thinking to myself, I thought when you land in one of those gigs, you're just, that's your gig. And you're, and when you're home, you're home and, and you know, you don't have to work on your days off. So uh, I like that work ethic of where if there's a, if I'm home and there's a gig, I'll do it. So I, I just took, you know, I kind of copied that, that work ethic. And, and we, in fact, uh, Ray and I did a lot of the gigs together because we were both with Dave. So we both had the same days off. So we were able to come home and do other gigs. And we actually did a thing where we did a, you know, like a Thursday with Dave, a Friday with cover band, Saturday with Dave, Sunday with cover band, a Monday with Dave. And uh, it was fun, you know, to be that busy. And it's, it doesn't give you time to get bored, obviously, or, and yeah. you just do it. You know, sometimes you look at the calendar and you see this schedule ahead of you and you're thinking, oh my God, how am I going to do this? It just looks impossible. And then when you do it, you just, I found that you just look at the next gig don't look at 30 gigs in a row, just go, okay, all I got to do is get from here to the airport, 
okay, I can do that. Then I get yeah. to get there to the gig and then I get back home. Okay. So if you chop it into little pieces, it's suddenly, it's not that big of a deal. But one of the craziest ones I ever did was when I was still with the Atomic Punks. Mm -hmm. We were playing at a place in, uh, in Santa Monica. I think it was called, oh, it was called 14 Below. It was a small club in Santa Monica on 14th Street, I guess. And uh, we were playing the next day at the Pepsi, is it Pepsi Center in Colorado? The Mile yeah. High Stadium. Yeah. We had a gig at the Mile High Stadium playing during the hockey game. And, the, and our, we were playing at 11 in the morning in Denver. And I, I remember being on stage at midnight in Santa Monica, thinking to myself, in less than 12 hours, I'm going to be playing a show in Denver, Colorado. And, I, and that's, that's one of those, this, something's going to go wrong. And sure enough, you know, we, after the gig, basically went home, took a shower, drove to the airport, got on the plane, flew, got in the car, drove, the gears there, you know, the rental gear, tune our stuff up, and that's, you know, we're playing, well, it all worked. It was just one of those things where yeah. it seems, it seems like crazy, but because it's that thought of in 12 hours from now, and be in, you know, another state playing another show. Anyway, so. Every now and then you'll see a documentary like the band Fozzie with Chris Jericho, where they played three shows in the same day in three different time zones. Or you think yeah. of Def Leppard. Def Leppard, the three continents. Yeah, that was exactly. awesome. Yeah. That's pure insanity. That's their problem. That's not my problem. But did you always have that work ethic and that hustle? I think I know the answer because you were a cover band guy that also gave guitar lessons and then eventually became, you know, a star in your own right. Yeah, I always, um, my thing was saying yes to every gig because mm -hmm. uh, but I, I had a day job, you know, back in the day and I hated it. And I remember um, I started playing with this top 40 band and it was for 50 bucks a night. And I played five sets, five 45 minute sets for 50 bucks, which is really chump change now. But at the time I was, you know, it's 250 a week. I was paying my bills. I was living and on that salary, on that money. But I really hated it because we were playing the same stuff over and over. And it was, you know, I was 21 years old and I wanted to be in a real original rock band. And uh, and I remember playing Sweet Home Alabama for the thousandth time going. And then I actually quit the band and got a job back at my old day job place, the record place that I worked at. And I remember after a month thinking, what, what was I thinking? This is this is terrible. So after that, I always said, I don't care if what song I'm playing the worst gig ever is better than a day job. So um, I never ever wished out my way out of any gig, no matter how crappy it was after that. What was the turning point in terms of your career? Was it Bo Nasty? Well, I don't think there was ever a turning point in my career because I really, unlike some people who go from playing at a in a bar band when they're 20 to being in, in a signed band when they're 22 and famous and buying mansions. <laughs> my, my ride was, is every step of the way. Dun, 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 like, so yeah. I didn't ever, I never really jumped any major, um, even, so I guess getting a record deal was a big thing at the time. But if I look back on, uh, you know, what I was doing, like I was, it was just another, it turned out to be just another gig. And then in the end, I really made no more money than I made doing cover gigs because we got a lump sum but it was then, you know, you get nothing for a year and then you get yeah. some royalties. So it was nice to get a $10,000 check, you know, at one time, like, whoa, this is big money. You know, when I'm, you know, when I was used to making 50 bucks a night, but then when you spread it over the living off it for the whole year, it really turned out to be about 50 bucks a night. So um, it didn't really, uh, it wasn't like I, my ship came in or anything like that. So, uh, and then I wasn't really happy in that band. And I actually left that band to play with a, my brother's band that was uh, doing original music, but more w wild and wacky stuff. So, uh, and then even with the Dave gig, it was, that was another pretty big step. But at the time I was really happy with what I was doing. I was teaching on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, playing mm -hmm. with the perfect world on Thursday, doing a disco thing or whatever. And then I was doing the atomic punks on Fridays and Saturdays. So my week was full. My days were, I, I surfed every day. I didn't, and so I could surf every morning and still go and play gigs. So my life was, I look at how much better does it get? I surf every day and I'm playing music for a living. I got no complaints. So when the Dave gig came along, um, it was really awesome. But the guys in the Atomic Punks didn't want me to do the Dave gig. They actually offered to pay me more money to turn <laughs> down David Lee Roth. So uh, I thought about it 
I go, well, there's no way I'm going to turn down Dave. But at least if I don't, the funny thing was I thought, well, if I, if I audition and don't get the gig now, I can just say I turn it down and get a raise. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, it, so it was a little, it was a little scary because I had to give up a lot, you know, uh, the teaching and all these things, you know, I knew I was going to lose all my students. And so if the Dave thing only lasted three months and ended, I was going to be back scraping for work again. Yeah. So it was like, even though it was kind of like a dream come true kind of thing, it wasn't anything to where I was going, Oh, I'm set, you know, for the rest of my life. I knew that it's, it's, this guy could go back to Van Halen any day. I, I was just hoping it lasted six months, you know, and then turned out to be six years. Yeah. In fact, when, when he, when he hired me, it was originally for two shows. So that when I got the call to play with Dave, it was for two festivals. And that was all that was asked. Can you play these two festivals with David Roth? I said, sure. And then a few, about a month later, I get a call. We're going to tour with Sammy Hagar the, for the whole summer. So, you know, then I, th that was the end of my surfing, you know, I'm now on tour <laughs> all the time. So, you know, see what I mean? You got to give up something. So I loved, I loved being on the road. It was great, but I did miss, there was a parts of my life that were like, now I'm sitting in hotel rooms all day instead of going to the beach. So, uh, and that can get pretty boring. Sure. But uh, so, you know, I never really looked at, I guess I was always realistic about things. I always knew that, that these are just really good jobs. And you're not going to turn into some rock god or something. These, a lot of people think that you're some something happens when you get in a famous band and suddenly you're some magical being. <laughs> you know, it's like I just look at it like this is a good job and I hope it lasts for a while. And then it lasted six years. Well, with that six years, I've seen you live by default more times than I've seen most musicians because, the, you know, that 04, 05, 06, 07 period, you guys like just did not stop touring. It's like. I'm in, I live on Long Island, New York. They're yep. playing New York yep. city. They're playing. One time I was in Japan and I saw you guys live there. You saw us what, in, which city? Uh, that was in Tokyo, Shibuya, Kokai. Yeah, that was our last, I think that was our last gig in Japan. Wow. That's, that's cool. Uh, my favorite part of that show was how, because the first time that you see Roth live, it's like, this is the best show I've ever seen. And then the second time you're like, that's the same exact show I saw, but this is still amazing. And then the third time, it's, it's kind of like that thing. So when he's talking in Spanish live in Japan, that just cracked me up because I think he was used to that part of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I really loved your version of the band. Most of the times I saw it, it was the two guitar thing with you and Toshi. Yeah. Which it wasn't for the Sammy tour. It was a one guitar thing. But I was trying to figure this out. You are the longest tenured musician he played with. Other than Ed, yeah. I, I thought about that too. It's kind of funny um, that of all the different guitar players that play with Dave, I, I played with him longer than anybody besides Eddie Van Halen, which is kind of cool. I think, um, you know, it was just the right time. And also, uh, I, Dave's one of those guys who he, he kind of sticks with what he knows. And as long as you don't do anything stupid, you know, <laughs> it's like, he, and that's really what it blows out to you. It's like, he can get irritated real easily and, and you just got to learn how to be around him. And it's, it's pretty easy um, to do. And of course, and he'll still have his moods here and there. Sure. But, um, I, just, I, I, I mean, in the, in the <laughs> six years of the hundreds of explosions I heard with him, I was only the, the target about two or three times. You know, it was usually uh, somebody that messed up or sometimes it was just everybody at once. That's, you know, but as far as me being singled out and being like the guy that was getting yelled at, it only happened once or twice. And uh, and I just let it bounce off me. That's another thing. You just go, oh, Dave's, you know, he's going to he's upset. He's going to yell. And he's got to blow off steam and then everything's going to be fine. So, uh, you know, it thickens your skin and you, and you, you learn it. So I think some people that, and also that really early on, most people within the first few months, they find out if they're right for that gig or not. Sure. You know? I mean, I saw so many monitor guys come and go in that first tour that we finally just started calling them by numbers. Um, like, we're like, okay, this is number five. <laughs> and, and, and what's funny is the guy that we called number five ended up staying around for five years. So for forever, he was named number five. And his, his name's actually Doug Short. And he's a great, hey, Doug. Yeah. He's a great, great tech and he's awesome. And we loved him. But it was funny because four guys that came and went like literally a week at a time, every, every week, a guy's here, they're gone. And I watched them blow it too. I mean, I remember telling one of the guys, I remember exactly the conversation. He's, I said, listen, I go, what's happening is these guys aren't watching Dave. They're looking at the board. They're looking at the board. And Dave's looking, they're trying to get their attention and, they, and they're not looking. So I said, you got to keep your eye on Dave all the time. 
And he goes, well, what if there's a problem on the board? I say, keep your eye on Dave. He goes, well, what if there's something spills? I go, keep your eye on Dave. And he goes, what if the board's on fire? I go, keep your eye on Dave. Well, two days later, he was fired because he didn't keep his eye on Dave. I told him, I go, if the board's on fire, keep your eye on Dave. And he just couldn't c- comprehend that. The other thing that uh, number five was good at was uh, when Dave, when Dave would be like uh, point, you know, his microphone and do this. Yeah. And then the monitor guy would, you know, hit it up a DB. Then they, Dave doesn't notice. Another DB. You know, five times later, it's finally getting somewhere. Number five, when Dave goes like this, Dave just, just he just <laughs> he just maxed it out, man, right away. And then Dave's like, yeah. Like, so that was the guy that like, okay, he gets it. When Dave says, I want it louder, you got to make a big enough move to where he really hears it get louder or he thinks you're not doing anything. So uh, that was the thing with Fiverr. He, 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 knew, he knew the drill. <laughs> Yeah. When I emphasize your tenure, you were there through the bluegrass experiment. In fact, you were, I saw you were on the Craig Ferguson show playing with the band for that. Oh, we did a bunch of, I did a bunch of the yeah. TV shows. Yeah. We did the CNBC. The, the uh, View, yeah. A- A&E breakfast with the arts. Yeah. The only one I missed was the Conan O'Brien show. And the reason I missed that was because we were also playing a gig in New York city. And Dave, Dave was going to do the Conan show which is filmed at like four or five o'clock. Yeah. And then with the bluegrass band and then head straight over to the gig. Yeah. And, and so, um, and I just felt like I didn't want the stress of having it. Cause I knew that if I did the Kona show the whole time, I'd be thinking, Oh my the gig's coming up and I gotta be hurt, like, rushed over there. So um, I skipped that one just so I could go with a sound check and be with the, with the band and be ready to go when Dave walked in. So I'm kind of bummed out. Now I look back, I should have just done the Conan show. Cause that's, that's a pretty cool TV show, you know, to put on your, you did plenty of those things. You were there for the radio show. I remember you were there on the, the morning K-Rock syndicated <laughs> show playing in and out of commercials. I was, yeah, I was Paul Schaefer. Exactly. That's what they called me. They, 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 I play out of the commercial, play, play back into the show. Yeah, you were doing that and you were playing over techno. So we saw a lot of um, diversity in terms of what you could play and improvise and all that. Even playing under conversations, which was very unique. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, Dave called it track blasting, and what I what what the deal was this. Dave, Dave took uh, he he's goes to the CD store back then. He used to I used to see him do it. He go to the st- store and he he come home with like twenty CDs. Yeah, and then he would he would listen to them and listen to them, and then he would pick out his favorite songs and have his guy make him these CDs of just the songs he liked. You know, like so he'd take twenty CDs and get it down to three. CDs of the greatest hits and he had he had hundreds of his greatest hits CDs and then what he did with those before the radio show he took cool sections of a song a little funky da- jam or whatever without singing and he would have the these guys um, loop that for like 10 minutes so they were just like a musical loop that lasted 10 minutes long and he made hundreds of those he animal would carry two big silver animal cases also on the show the security yeah. guard yes yeah, yeah. The gi- giant animal would carry these these uh, cases full of these cds and and uh and all they were were just grooves and grooves and grooves of different right. and they were all genres different keys in fact a couple some of them weren't tuned to a440 so what a few of them like i couldn't play along with them because the i'd be out of tune sounding they were between a and a flat somewhere yeah but most of them were fine and so he wouldn't let me know what's going to happen. Like they would just put on his, he just played track number three and then they'd be coming out of the commercial and the music comes on. I got to find the key and start soloing. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and he liked a certain style, you know, he liked me to keep it kind of bluesy, funky, yeah. you know, there was a thing that like, so he didn't really want me to go wild or anything, but uh, it was, it was definitely a neat experience. Yeah. That show. Yeah. So I'm just showering you with praise here because I saw you live that many times. It was always great. And in my opinion, that's the last great, although I saw the, the Vegas shows and all that, I thought it was the last great Roth band in terms of the set list that you were able to go between a couple of deep cuts and the solo material and the Van Halen hits. And then you'd get a DOA and all that. It was maybe the last tour that happened. Well, the first, that was my, to me, the 2002 tour was my favorite set list. And it was the only one that I was the only guitar player on, which I liked that because it was like, it's a, there's a thing with Van Halen that you want that sound. When we added the second guitar, we had to really work to try to make it sound right with two guitars because it's just not supposed to be. Right. So, um, and the first, uh, the 2002 set list was definitely the heaviest set list. I mean, that was the set list that I'm the one, DOA, Atomic Punk, all this stuff. 
And, uh, and then every year, Atomic Punk would leave and uh, J- Jesse Gigolo would come in. And then uh, yeah. you know, DOA would go away and uh, j- like um, some of the lighter tunes. It, 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 uh, I can't remember the uh, California Girls. So yeah. um, it was fun, but I really enjoyed the heavy stuff the best because that was like, to me, that's like the prime Van Halen, the first two records. You know, we were, we were playing most of the first two records and then a bunch of other stuff. So that was really cool. Yeah, and those set lists, the videos, a lot of people ask me, hey, you know, what's your favorite stuff from this era, Dave? And I always go to this Carson Daly performance, which you were on, where you do yeah. Mean Street. Mean Street, and we had in Panama, too. I don't know if it showed it, though. Oh, but yeah. I'm not sure if that's online, but the classic moment is you can see that you, and I, I think it was a James Lomenzo playing bass on that tour. Yes, uh, you can see that clearly you and James have to get out of the way at this point because otherwise you're going to get kicked in the face oh, right, uh, during right. the first spin kick and all that. You know, yeah, we, we knew when to run. Hey, uh, if you watch any videos of us from that tour, or pretty much any tour, and watch it when it gets to jump, when it gets that middle keyboard section where James starts spinning that bar, yeah, we all run. We all just go. I, I go behind my amp. My, my routine was my, my tech would have a, a, a can of Budweiser, a nice cold can of Budweiser. And then right when the, he, when I get around the speakers, he pop it and I would down the whole thing. Cause it's the end of the show. So I could down I would, I, my, my thing was to try to drink the whole beer before he finished that part and run back out. That's a little secret. No one knew about I was drinking a beer. <laughs> wow. Wow. So there was rumors, um, you know, when you're a fan and you go to concerts and you're trying to get that front space and you kind of have to wait for a while because you're like, you want to be in the front. So then you have to make small talk with all the other people that are going. And there's always one or two guys that are, quote unquote, insiders and they know everything that's going to happen. And there's one or two guys that are going, oh, yeah, well, I heard that uh, Brian was asked to do this residency, but he couldn't do it due to scheduling reasons, that kind of thing. That, that's that kind of true. That you oh. talking about the, the Vegas residency? Yeah, from last year. My wife and I, that was uh, our second to last concert well, before COVID. Well, I'll, I can tell you exactly what happened. Um, I got a phone call. Let me try to remember who this was now. Let me think. Was it, it was uh, Brett Tuggle. And, uh, you know, he was with Fleetwood Mac for a long time, but he was with Dave back in the day. And um, he, he mentioned that there was going to be this. This was in uh, 2019. Was residency in 2020? I can't remember. Yeah, early now. 2020. Yeah. So it was about the middle of 2019. So it was like seven months before, eight months before the residency thing happened. He just said that they were going to be doing this residency with Dave in Vegas. And, and they were working with guys, still kind of checking out guys and, and was I like, interested in doing it? And uh, it was, wasn't like an offer, but it was more like a just checking to see. What, and yeah. we talked a little bit. Yeah. And the truth was, is that my 2020 calendar was booked solid. And it was, you know, and I was happy with what I was doing. Once again, I come home almost every night, you know, um, and I've toured and I like, like touring. And it's, of course, I'd always would do it if the money's right and it's the right gig. But when I can make you know, a good living and be able to stay home, I, I prefer that right now. Sure. I, mean, I'm, I just got married, you know, so I don't want to leave my girl. And uh so I, I thought about it, but we, we talked a little bit about it and uh, it just turned out that it was, it was better because basically I was going to have to ask for a big pile of money to, to, to uproot myself because I knew I was going to be stuck in Vegas, sitting in hotel rooms, doing nothing, waiting for a show every day. For, and I, I really, I hate that. Here's how bad I hate sitting in hotel rooms. Okay. We'll play two nights. Okay, we, I live three hours from Houston. It's yeah. a three hour drive to Houston. If we play two nights in a row in Houston, I will drive home after the show and then drive back to Houston the next day. Wow. So that means I will play in Houston, be done at one in the morning, drive home, get home at 4 a.m., sleep in my bed, wake up at noon, be at home till four, and then get on the road and drive back to Houston. That's how much I hate sitting in a hotel room. Because what happens in the hotel room is you get kicked out at noon. Then I got eight hours sitting in my car, driving around Houston, going to the bookstore, it, and and when you're trying to kill eight hours or something in a town and I, that you've been to a thousand times, I've, been, I've played in Houston twice a month for 13 years and uh, you just run out of stuff to do and you're, you're just sitting there and I just can't stand it. I'd rather be driving to and from 
and do something than to sit around. In my, I mean, I used to park my car and I can't even go to a movie because I got guitars in my car. I got stuff. So I can't yeah. like go to a movie because I got I got a carload of gear. So it's like I can't just sit there and park my car and go to a movie, it, especially if it's hot out my car. So I have to keep my car running all day, too, because it's 100 degrees out. My guitars are in the car, so I can't just park and, you know, and sit there and sweat for five hours. So yeah. I'm sitting there parked with my car running, doing my little Japanese lessons on my phone. It's it just, it's terrible. So that, um, that was my next question. Actually, I was going to say, what is the car hobby? Because you're a productive, thoughtful kind of person and you just answer it. Japanese lessons. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of, and then when I'm driving though, it's, it's funny. I don't do that. My lessons so much when I'm driving, I try, they have ones that you can just listen to, but they're not my favorite ones. Um, Pimsler, the, I think that is Pimsler or Berlitz. No, no, I, I mean, it's called Japanese Pod 101. It's a, oh. it's a, it's a, it's a thing I'm signed up for where they do a lesson, where they do a dialogue, but their, their dialogue, it, it, it's like a, they do it kind of slow and it's a long dialogue and you only learn three words. It's one of those, it's not my, I, I, I enjoy Duolingo, which you oh, have yeah. to sit there with your phone to do. And I got a lot of books too. So those are things I can't do while I'm driving. So oh, the other thing I used to do when I was driving, this is bad. Um, about 10 years ago, I've been playing chess since the early nineties. I got all hooked on chess and I joined a chess online chess, chess.com mm -hmm. in, around 2009. And I joined all these chess tournaments. They're like these online tournaments where you can get 50 games going and you just make one move a day. You make a move, you go all your games, yeah. make a move. Then the next day you come back and see what moves were made against you. So, you, so what I would got to a point where I'd be on stage <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're playing on stage and i'm just picturing the chess position i'm in right now and i'm all i'm stressing over some chess move and then i'll be in my car driving looking at my chessboard coming home at three in the morning and uh i don't do that anymore but uh, i never got close to the in a record or anything but it was a. Uh, I was pretty hooked. I was pretty addicted to that thing for a while. Is there a secret heavy metal chess community? I know that there is a hip hop one. We go to the metal one. I think Ingve is a, a chess guy. Really? I didn't know that. Oh, well, he referred to one time tennis as being uh, chess meets boxing. I think he wants to call yeah, it. That doesn't mean he plays it, though. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Or, but but uh, do you have other musicians that you play with or, you know, you don't have to name names or is your no, no. When personal I'm online, life separate? It's just, it's just, it's chess.com. You just play random. I don't know who these people are. There's all over the world. I mean, ah. I play people all, it's just people, the, it's a worldwide chess website. It's probably the number one, if you chess.com, obviously chess they com. got that one first, you know, the, and uh, there's thousands and thousands of people on it. And also there's international masters and grandmasters on it who go under little weird little names so you, you kind of find out who they are i've never played any of those guys but um there's been people who've been lucky enough to get games against really you know world champ type people so it's pretty cool cool do you got time for three quick questions and then you're a free man brian of course yeah okay first one because you've always been mysterious like we know hey he's on stage he delivers the goods he's good he smiles he's pleasant but we don't know much about you so do you have a favorite band of all time of course, my I can name my two favorite bands of all time. You know, the first it, it started with the Beatles, and then the next, and then now, and then it was Led Zeppelin. I mean, I was a you know, Beatles fan since before I could walk. My dad played Beatles all the time. He loved the Beatles, so I was completely, totally into the Beatles. Hard Day's Night, that whole mop top era was my favorite. And then, um, and then of course, I loved Kiss. Is why I started playing guitar. So they're still one of my favorites. Um, I mean, when I was 12 years old, I got on a kiss, saw that picture of Ace Freely with a smoking guitar. I go, yeah. that's what I want to do. And then, uh, but Led Zeppelin would be, if I had to pick a one all-time favorite Zeppelin, just they've been my favorite band since I was in ninth grade. TV show, is there a favorite TV show of the moment? Um, I got a million. Once again, we'll go back to those old shows. I mean, I grew up on, you know, Get Smart, I Dream a Genie, Bewitched, nice. you know, uh, all that stuff. I love Andy Griffith's show. I love all those good old shows. And then um, I, I, for newer shows, I liked, you know, Seinfeld and I got into Cheers for a while but, and Married with Children, of course, but I think it's, you know, kind of trashy. But um, oh, it holds up. Married yeah. with Children still holds up all these yeah. years later. I, I love Family Guy just as far as just irreverent comedy that just i mean it's probably one of the only shows that really makes me actually laugh out loud you know i usually think things are funny but i'm not cracking up but um family guy there's stuff that makes me crack up but as far as right uh, i would say my what i think is like one of the best shows but i'm, I'm re-watching it now i watched the whole thing one time through about 
a few years back. And now we're just starting to watch it through again, me and my girl, because we loved Game of Thrones. We thought that was the most big. It's got the whole massive stories, all these things. I mean, I I knew about this show for like five years, you know, while people were watching it and talking crap about it. And uh, I never saw the show. And I just, you know, whatever people, oh, yeah, Game of Thrones. Uh, I, some people I'm proud to say I've never watched episode. Well, finally, we had been, we always do that thing. Where we'll, we'll buy a whole series and watch it. And at some point we said, hey, let's buy the first season of Game of Thrones. See if we like it. If we do, we'll, we'll get the rest. And so we we did and we we loved it. And we watched the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, this is this is a great show. It's like, well, I think it's one of the greatest epic shows I've ever seen on television. So um, that's a fun show. And so we're just starting to rewatch it right now just because it's COVID time. Yeah. Because we went through Sopranos. See, Sopranos, I was disappointed in Sopranos. I thought it was good. I loved it. I watched the whole thing. But I didn't think it really lived up to all the hype that everyone talked about. I think people, it's mafia thing, so you got to be cool. <laughs> movie, I, I like Goodfellas. Now, Goodfellas I love yes. as a movie because I think that movie is just, I love the comic. I think it's funny. You know, there's a lot of violence and it's brutal, but they're so funny. And then Snatch. Have you seen Snatch? Yeah, the Brad Pitt. Uh, yeah. What's it's his name? Got Guy Ritchie? Jason Statham. Yeah, Guy Ritchie directed it. That's to me, people who don't know about that, they got to watch it. If you like Goodfellas or the, the uh, mafia type, but it's British, it's also hilarious. It's it's a funny movie where they're all after this giant diamond. There's different groups of people that you get to know. Yeah, uh, that, yeah that's a, a super great movie. And, I saw it three times at the movie uh, theater. And what's up with Brad Pitt's accent in that Man, movie? He's a pikey. <laughs> <laughs> they even have a special on the DVD. Yeah. There's a special translator just for his for the Pikes. There, it's a Pikey, uh, you know, subtitle because it's so you you cannot tell what they're saying. It's hilarious. But then when you read the subtitle, you go, yeah, they they said that. <laughs> so the main stuff I've I've learned here about you, Brian Young, is you never stopped working. There was no big break. The good taste goes beyond the music. Uh, you're continually learning and growing. Uh, you don't want to be on the road, but you want to play live. You I'll do it. I'll do it. If, I, if, if the right opportunity came up, I'd love to be on tour. Okay. Uh, don't go to you anymore to record the demos of the tracking, but you have the gear for it. What, what, was, what was that? Don't go. No, actually, no, I want to do it. Oh, no, you, I forgot to tell you that part. I'm back into it now. Oh, okay. Oh, we no, I got a circle. Oh, that's my point is that six months ago um, when I started doing that, heartbreak station and recording with those guys um i wanted you know i i relearn i had to relearn how to, or learn how to use this digital stuff but no i i'm fully back into it now i mean i love doing it now that i'm home so i've i've got a new love for for recording and mixing and it's going to take me a while to really get back up to speed i in fact i've just got a new computer on the way because my i my like I outgrew my computer with my new logic and all my plugins that I'm getting. I'm like, Oh man, I got to upgrade. So no, I am, I'm a hundred percent. I'll, I'll record send me stuff. I'll, I'm, I'm into it. Okay. Then my last, I love when people send me full tracks, like the whole drum tracks and the bass. And then I just put it to, I'm, I'm actually doing a heaven and hell with a drummer in Argentina. The one that we did the Van Halen thing with, yeah. he just sent me a track. Joe Red is singing on it. He sounds amazing. And so, uh, I'm waiting for the bass track because I started recording over the drums and vocal but I didn't like, I couldn't dial in the tone I wanted. So I, I asked them to, to get the bass guy to do his track so I can play with the drums and bass. And then I'm going to do a track. So I'm doing that. I got a bunch of stuff I'm working on with this guy out, Mr. Scary out in, in Missouri. And uh, same thing. He's sent me so many tracks. I mean, it's like 40 track, you know, it's got 40 tracks of, uh, and I'm trying to mix it, but that's when my computer started crashing. So I have to, um, so I got this new computer, but it's not going to be here for two more weeks. So yeah, so I, I was, I was, I stopped being that guy in 2007, but, but I've been sitting at home for a long time now. And so I have a new love for it. In fact, I was telling my girl the other day, I said, I enjoy this so much that if I couldn't play live anymore, I could do this and be happy. I mean, I really love doing the, the mixing and stuff. So I love it again. Wow. Okay. And the closer, which is the easiest one is, if somebody does want to hire you or something to that effect to play on their stuff, to mix their stuff, to demo the stuff, what's the best way to find you? Just go to Facebook. That's where I mostly people hit me on Facebook all the time. Just uh, my Facebook page. Wow. Okay. Well, Brian, I can't thank you enough for your time and the many years of great music. So keep it up and looking forward to more videos, even if it's not more Vandenberg. Looking forward to what's hey, yeah. next. Hey, the, the, the Black Sabbath is coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Bye.